I've been really blown away by how many people have come to this event in general, and I know there are at least a handful who've traveled quite a long way to get to, so it's, it's really nice to see. Uh, so we're going to be talking now about mobile security uh, and what, uh, what things you should be bearing in mind, some ways in which you can address some of the risks, what are the known risks. So what I, what I like to do at the start of this talk is just talk about putting on two different hats, two different ways of looking at this. One of an app developer, and that could be anybody on the development team, and one of the CIO who is ultimately responsible for the success and the security of the app and the data that it handles. Um, so how many of you are app developers? Yeah. Any CIOs? OK, may, maybe you have to pretend to be CIOs, but it's, it's a useful viewpoint, <laughs> and it, nevertheless. If you're, if you're working on an app, you might have a high level of confidence that it's secure, or you might not. But if you are confident, your confidence might be justified, or it might not. You might be mistaken. And ultimately, you want to, you want to know how you can get that confidence, know that it's justified, and be able to convey that confidence to somebody else in a, an objective way, and in a way that's auditable and can be proven. So if you're, uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a CIO who's got responsibility, you not only want to get that confidence yourself, but you want to be able to have it in an auditable way, in a way that is very easy for you to present to somebody else and say, this is why I think this app is secure. These are the boxes that it ticks. Um, because, yes, ultimately, you. You hope you're never in this situation, but the person making those decisions has to be thinking, OK, six months from now, 12 months from now, if something goes horrendously wrong, how would I justify the decision I'm making today? What, what information have I got to back it up? So how many of you are already familiar with OWASP? OK, a handful. That's good. Uh, so it's, it's it's a project that's been around for a lot of years now, originating in web development, and uh, they're trying to identify common security risks and um, recommended ways of mitigating those risks. So for a, a long time now, they've had an OWASP top 10. It gets revised reasonably frequently, and that is, on the, in the web dev world, that tends to be the go-to starting point. If you're working for an enterprise client and you're doing web development, you'll come across this. They're, they're all, or even if it's not phrased like this, the contents of the security requirements you'll be given will probably contain the contents of this. Over more recent years, they've expanded that to cover mobile development as well. So we do now have uh, a top 10 for mobile and a whole host of documentation and material on the OWASP website with security guidelines. And then moving on from the top 10, they also define their application security verification standards. Uh, and that is a, a longer document. And, and that chapter 17 is specific to mobile, but you can't just read it and read that chapter and think you've covered all of mobile. There are, there are bits interspersed throughout of it. But, but that's where you'll find most of the mobile content. Um, what I'm going to be going through today is looking at the top 10, and then the ASVS will be reading material if you want to take it further. So a very, a very brief bit of short history. <coughs> I'll actually jump across to where I've got all of these listed. Uh, so I think 2014 was the second top 10 they did. Uh, the current one is the one they published 2016, uh, and there's always ongoing research and opportunities to get involved in that research if you want to, to try and establish what's the, what is the next top 10 list going to contain. <coughs> so you can see there's some development there from 2014 through to 2016. Some of it's just rewording, uh, but there are, there are some changes to note. And the first one is, uh, the list used to contain weak server-side controls as the highest risk um, security issue 
for mobile development. That's now gone from the list, and I think rightly so, because it's actually talking about web security. It was always referring to security weaknesses within a web API or a web endpoint that you're accessing from an app. We've then got a bit of uh, consolidation where um, we've got insufficient, in, sorry, insecure data storage and unintended data leakage. And I, I'm mentioning this because we'll look at uh, one of each of those in a moment, but they're both now covered by a uh, single item in the top 10, M2. Uh, one other change to note is authentication and authorization each now get their own entry in the top 10. So for those that aren't aware, authentication is talking about the process of who are you? Are you who you say you are? Can I believe you are who you say you are? And then authorization is, okay, now that I believe you are who you say you are, what can you do? What will I let you do within the app or within the, the web endpoints? Uh, most of the others came across, but then the other thing to highlight is we had two brand new ones in 2016. Uh, that's improper platform usage and extraneous functionality. So I'll, I'll, I'll go into what, what each of these specifically means in a moment. But one of, the, one of the other things I wanted to look at, outside of that top 10, there are other institutions that do research into security and come out with uh, reports on what they think they see as the risks. Now, most of the time, there's really good overlap between what they say and uh, the OWASP project. Um, but there are, are some interesting points here. So this is taken from a Ponemon report. So 2017 study on mobile and IoT application security. Um, I think I've got a URL for it at the bottom of one of these slides. But if, if I don't and you want to get hold of it, just let me know afterwards. They came out saying, um, amongst perception of companies, Malware is still perceived among the highest risks on, on mobile. Now, it's been, it's been a while now since we had a compromised version of Xcode being used in China and that causing uh, compromised apps to, to reach the App Store. Um, but uh, you'll see with, as we go through the detail of some of the OWASP top 10, how hackers can get into apps, inject their own code, and have it look like it's an authentic app, but actually there is some malware embedded inside it. And as I say, companies are, are seeing this as the highest risk. This one I found surprising. So 63% of companies are either not confident or have no confidence they even know what apps are being used in their organization. Of that 63%, uh, I believe 33% Sorry, yeah, 33% had absolutely no confidence at all, which is a, a little bit of a worry. This next one is something that, in practical terms, comes up whenever you're talking about an app that has to be secure, that's handling sensitive data that needs to be secured, uh, which takes priority, end user convenience or security. Now, you sit in a security forum like this, and you think, well, obviously, it's got to be security. You can't have your data compromised. But then, as you're working through the app, the app has got to make life significantly more convenient for the user. Otherwise, you won't get adoption. Um, and I have seen pragmatic decisions made here where user convenience has been given priority over security. But the point of asking the question is just to make sure that whoever is actually responsible for that decision is aware of the consequences of it. Um, for end user convenience as well, in an enterprise setting, you can read business continuity. There may be times when um, you've got somebody out in the field using your app on a device, and if suddenly he can't, he's prevented for any reason from doing what he needs to do there and then, the cost to the company of that break in his work might be higher than the cost of a data breach, depending on what data he's got on the device. And that's where the kind of convenience kicks in again. They did also find that although we've got established and well-documented lists of threats and peer-reviewed lists of threats, um, there's a surprisingly small number of companies who are actually attaching urgency to resolving them or addressing them. 
and couple that with the companies that they talked to, 60% of them said they'd already suffered, oh, there's the way they categorize whether or not they've already suffered a security breach. Um, so I was just going to look at the, the breakdown of that. Okay, I think it was 11% uh, were, uh, they knew with certainty they'd had a security breach due to an insecure mobile app. So presumably they're among the ones that are actually addressing it urgently. Oh, I'll leave that up there for a second. If you can read that at the bottom, that's the name of the report. <coughs> so if we now look at uh, causes behind these perceptions, these perceived risks, some other findings still from uh, summarized from that report. This was very concerning. Testing of mobile apps is ad hoc or not done at all. And this was specifically talking about security testing. Um, on average, 29% of apps were tested for security <coughs> vulnerabilities, and on average, 30% of apps contain vulnerabilities. And even more concerning, 39% of the companies said that their apps get security tested in production. So the next, uh, next big reason was insecure coding practices. And this is where we can reference back to the OWASP documents. And they've got a, a very good list now that's been expanded over the last year or so of cheat sheets and reference guides on how to address things on specific platforms. <coughs> so this, the one thing I found interesting here, we've actually got a, a decent number now, just under 60% of organizations saying they do train their mobile developers in secure coding practices. But also 65% said accidental coding errors are responsible for their security vulnerabilities. So maybe the, the training needs to be a bit more, uh, a bit more intense. They did find that um, broken cryptography or in insufficient um, encryption listed on the, the OWASP top 10 and unintended data, data leakage are the most difficult ones to mitigate to check and make sure you're doing something about them and make sure you spot it every, every occurrence. And uh, since I started talking about this, I, I originally had a lack of internal policies for companies listed as a high reason why they, they don't have all these secure coding practices. They still have vulnerabilities in their codes. And now in 2017, that is still listed as, uh, as one of the main reasons. And when it, even if you don't have a security policy, you've got all these OWASP documents that you can just make your security policy if, if you've not got the budget to put anything else into it. But the main reason is rush to release. I see all the grins. <laughs> now that's um, the pressure of deadlines and rushing to release an app, that's, that's a reality we face. It's never gonna change, it's never gonna go away. Um, and the only way to really address that is to change the habits, make sure you've got secure coding practices, make sure they're known, make sure they're part of your day-to-day -day operations, uh, and even get to the point where, you know, when you're doing code reviews, make sure security is considered. Um, you can even look at doing check-in hooks to make sure, check for certain things and refuse check-ins if something's not done quite right. Um, but there is, there's certainly room for improvement of general habit in that, in that regard. So let's take a look at the top 10. This first one, the, the new kid on the block, was improper platform usage. Now this is specific to um, making sure that if you're doing, it, doing something to do with security on a platform, let's say iOS for example, iOS will have a recommended way of doing it and if you're not doing it that way, you're breaking this guideline. Uh, so this is somewhere where it's great that we can do our cross-platform mobile development and there is an awful lot you can share, but there are things like this where you do need to know specifics of the platforms you're implementing on if, there's, if you handling sensitive data and security is important to you. <coughs> now I'm gonna walk through an example of this. Um, 
And I've got a shout out to Matthew Robbins here because he supplies some of the details of this. I don't know if any of you have come across Matthew or use MFractor. Yeah, there's one at the back. If you haven't used MFractor and you use Visual Studio, then you really should go and have a look at it. There's a free version and it, it makes life much easier as a, a dev tool. So you'll see here, I'm, talking, I'm going to be talking about uses clear text traffic on Android from API 23 onwards. Um, slight side note, if you're on API 24 onwards, um, this is superseded if you've got a network security config in place that will override this. This is still worth talking about because it's Android, because you still have a, a wide variety of versions of operating systems and different devices out in the market. If this was an iOS feature and I was about to tell you something about iOS 10 that is overridden in iOS 11, there's not that much point talking about it because in six months most people will be on iOS 11. So that of interest, who's on iOS 11 already? And as you're in a security talk, is it jailbroken? Okay. It's, uh, yeah, it's already, with, with that just being released, it's already very easy to find out how to do that and to, to end up with jailbroken iOS 11. So this, this setting um, is designed to, if, if you set it to, um, so if you set it to false, your app shouldn't be allowing clear text traffic over an HTTP connection. It should only allow it over HTTPS. That, that's what is the, the feature is designed to supply. Um, and the default value is true. So if you don't specify this, your app will allow uh, on Android, um, transmission of clear text over an unsecure connection. Um, but just setting that isn't enough. You have to set that, and then you have to expose that value to your code, and you have to check for it manually. It's also possible for you to set that and check it manually and do everything right and make use of some third-party components that don't honor it and ignore it and expose a security breach because of that, a security vulnerability, sorry. If you have a, a quick look at how we set that up, and hopefully you can see that, okay. So this is just looking at the um, app manifest .xml in the Xamarin Android project. Yep. Okay, I'll try it. Just signal again if I if I dip and you can't hear again. Okay, Thanks. Um, so you can see in the when you view it as source, you can add that line. Uh, uses clear text traffic equals false. So that will be your first step. But then we have to expose the value of that to our code. So what happens when your Android app starts up? It'll read this value and assign it to pointing at the wrong screen here, to this property in the network security policy instance. Um, if you guys are familiar with MVVM and using the Xamarin Forms dependency service, you'll recognize a lot of that code. If not, don't worry. That's the important part. Those are the only, the only lines that are actually critical here. Um, but what I'm doing here is uh, writing something in the Xamarin Android project, in the platform project, that will return the value of that property that's been set by the app when it starts up and is determined by the app that we put, the value that we put in the Android manifest.xml. So that's the second step. We specified it in the, Andro uh, the app manifest and uh, exposed it to our app here. But then we need to make use of it Sorry, were you taking a picture of the previous slide? I'll check with uh, Ben today. I, I presume he's going to have a centralized place to put all the presentations. But if not, uh, I'll, I can get him to share where I put mine. I usually put them onto SlideShare. So I, I can make this all available. <coughs> so this is showing an example of uh, some code that you might have you're setting up a web client and 
passing in a URL, downloading a string from that URL, and returning it. At the moment, if you set up those first two steps and you put this code in your project, th those first two steps will be wasted because you're ignoring the value that we've set in the, uh, in the manifest and the value that's been exposed. So what you actually need to do is something like this. So here we're first checking that we've got a network policy service class. Then we're looking at the URL that's passed in. If that starts with HTTP colon, which means it's not HTTPS, then uh, and we're going to look at that, is clear text traffic permitted? And if those tests fail, then we're not even going to attempt the communication. That's all well and good, but um, this is then when it gets interesting. If you actually go and look at the documentation on Android's website, it also still singles out WebView as something that dishonors this setting. So if this is critical to you, then you've got to be very careful about what third-party components and even what native components you use. So the next one we'll take a look at is insecure data storage. And that, that list that I popped up at the start with the, the 2014 list and the 2016 list, if you remember, this was made up of a consolidation of two separate items on the old list. <coughs> so these are things that are listed as um, likely culprits for each of these. Um, in my mind, SQLite gets a bit of a bad rap. Is, is listed as um, like the, the place where insecure data is found most commonly. Um, but I would say that's because where data is stored most commonly. I don't know that it's any specific weakness of SQLite over any other method of storage. It's just that's the one that people use a lot. So that's where, when they get it wrong, that's where the results are. Um, the unintended data leakage as well. Um, you, make sure, you have to make sure these days you're cons considering things like analytics, if you want rich analytics so you can see what your users are doing. Uh, and if they're having a problem, you find out before they tell you and you can, you've got enough detail to solve the problem and send out an update before they even report it. That's the ideal that you want to aim for. But depending on the data your app is handling, you may or may not have the flexibility to transmit that data to your analytics engine. Um, you, you, you've got to be careful there. So I'm going to look at a uh, couple of uh, a couple of these, one from each list. The first one is um, leaking data via images. And on iOS, if you double tap the home button, if you've still got a home button, it'll go into the task switcher. And at that point, the operating system takes a screenshot of your app, and it shows all the screenshots of the apps that it's got. Um, if, you, if your app is nice and secure, you've got your communication secure, your data is all encrypted properly, you've authenticated your user properly, you've authorized them, so you've established that whoever's using it is allowed to see the information that's currently on screen, even though that information is sensitive. The danger is, if you don't do something here, they can push the home button to go out of their app, and then when they double tap, if, if somebody else double taps the home button on their phone, you haven't authenticated them. You don't know that it's the same person, but they can still see the screenshot. If they try and switch to your app, maybe you've got stuff in there to detect that and force them to authenticate again, but they might still be able to see some sensitive data on that screenshot as they scroll past it. And this was actually one of the, one of the very early ways one of the, the first iPhone was, was hacked. So the way to approach that, and you can see here again where platform-specific knowledge comes in. Um, on iOS, you can intercept that and do a few things. Uh, and you can see here what we'll be doing is taking our own screenshot, applying a blur to it, putting that blurred image over the top of the app, 
and then passing control back to the operating system so that when it takes a screenshot, it's taking a screenshot of our blurred image and not of the app. And then when the app is activated again, we obviously want to remove that blurred image so the user doesn't see that and get faced with that and, and try to use it. A um, couple of quirks just to point out here. You'll see, in order to achieve this, I'm overriding on resign activation and I'm overriding on activated. And this is in the I, uh, Xamarin iOS platform project. Um, if you look at the things you can override, it does look like you've got a few choices here. You, you also come across did enter background and will enter foreground. Um, the reason I'm not using those is if you're in your app and you tap the home button once, go to your home screen, your app will go to the background. So did enter background will fire. From within your app, if you double tap and go straight to the task switcher, at that point your app hasn't en technically entered the background. So that doesn't fire. But it has resigned activation. So for, for safety, it's on resign activation and on activated that you need to use for this. Uh, if, you've, if you've done work with background services on platforms, then you, you may, have, may have used uh, did enter background and will enter foreground. So the first step would be to take a screenshot uh, of the iOS app yourself. Uh, and that's fairly straightforward code there to do that. And that ends up storing it in the image object. Excuse me a second. How's that? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, OK, once we've got that image, and we want to apply a blur to it. Now, if anyone is really into their graphics, you might look at that and think, oh, I know a much better way to do that, uh, a much simpler way to do that. This is, this is one way to do it. <laughs> um, and you could, get in, you could get quite complex here. This is just applying a blur to the entire screen. Other things you can do would be um, maybe you don't bother taking a screenshot and applying a blur to it. You've just got a company logo image that fills the screen, and you've got versions of that for all orientations and resolutions, and you just slap that over the top and hide the app underneath it. Uh, I've also seen people talk about a development framework that lets you mark individual fields as sensitive, and then you can have code in here that goes and kind of redacts information from specific fields. Um, that might seem a bit of overkill when you can just do this. Um, but it does mean you can do that in an auditable way. You can prove that the code that does that redaction works. You can have other checks to make sure you're marking the right fields as sensitive. So the last thing then is to take that blurred image that we've got and uh, add that, add that subview to the view. So that's what's currently displayed. And then the operating system will come and take its screenshot. And then the last step, when the app is activated again, is to remove that blurred view and let your app come back to life. Obviously, depending on what else is going on in your UI, you might have other things in that, um, in that last bit of code. So that's kind of a, a very quick run through of one way to address one of the things on one of those lists of M1. Uh, yeah, M1. Um, but as you saw from the, those lists, there are plenty of other ways of breaching the first one. And each one of those will have multiple ways of uh, solving it. So it, it's, I find it a fascinating area. So there's, there's certainly a lot, a lot you can do there. Um, the next thing I'm going to look at is insecure data storage. Uh, now, I mentioned data being stored in SQLite and that being very common. Um, there are yeah, a, a number of other things you can do for, for data. But if you read through the OWASP guidelines on, uh, on how to store data securely, they do specifically mention SQL Cipher. So has, has anyone come across that or used it? OK. it's. Um, it is open source in C++, and there are paid components on the Xamarin Component Store, uh, which are Xamarin implementations of that. Um, it's a while since I checked the price. The last time I looked, I think it was 500 US per platform, which 
kind of sounds like a lot, but on the other hand, if you look at taking the C++ code yourself and bringing that in, if it, at enterprise rates, if that takes more than a day, then just buy the components. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm going to walk through implementing SQL Cypher in a way that I would normally implement SQL Lite. So just bear with me while I slide things across. Okay, I've got to say no if it's a security talk. Okay, maybe I'll just switch Wi-Fi off and that can... Okay. Almost there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so that looks kind of small. How many of you can read it? Let me see what I can do about that. Okay, that's helping with the code, but not with the, the structure on the left. Um, I'll just collapse all these, and I'll, I'll walk through, and hopefully they'll, we'll be able to see enough to, to make out what's going on. Um, so this, this structure is just a, like a personal preference of mine. I'll have solution folders uh, where I'll have one folder containing the platform projects, a separate one containing shared projects, and a separate one containing all the tests. Um, I have seen compelling blog posts recently for arguments for structuring it completely differently, but this is just what I end up with and what I'm used to now, so I like it. Um, so how many, how many are familiar with MVVM? Okay, all right, that's cool. Uh, so what I would typically have for a SQLite implementation is uh, a, an interface class in my portable class library um, defining the interface with uh, a data service class, and I would then have an implementation of that where I put all the SQLite code. Um, that then gives me the flexibility to, flexibility to say at some point in the future, okay, I'm going to throw out SQLite and I'm going to bring in CatchBase. I'll just write a CatchBase implementation of that data service class. The rest of the app doesn't change. That works very nicely, so I use it as a standard approach, even if I'm confident it's going to stay SQLite. Uh, what it does allow you to do is then replace that SQLite implementation with a SQL Cypher implementation. But that's not quite as straightforward as just putting all of that in the portable class library. If you, if you prefer, if you're a forms developer and you prefer using shared projects to portable class libraries, then this is something that is a bit easier for you. Uh, I, I fall in the portable class library camp and I actually break out into a shared project just for this. So because SQL Cypher is making use of the uh, encryption parts of the .NET library, uh, you have to be able to include those. And the PCL profile that we tend to use doesn't include them. So you actually have to put the SQL Cypher code into the platform project and not into the portable class library. Um, if you go and do that for Android, for example, you get all that working, and then you go to repeat the process for iOS, you'll pretty soon spot that the code you're putting into the iOS project is identical to the code in the Android project. So that then makes it a candidate to rip it out and put it into a shared project that they both reference. So you're ending up writing the code once, and you still talk about it being shared. But that's why, for those, of the, those that can make that out, in my shared folder there, I've got a pullable class library and a shared project. So um, I'll just look briefly at, in the shared project, so this is where I'd have my uh, SQL Cypher data service. And the only thing really to look at here is, well, let's start with this. So this is a bit of code that just reads data from the database. And you can see that's not, that's not really doing anything clever with encryption at this point. It e doesn't even look like it knows about encryption. If I jump back 
to the platform project and I'll look at iOS. You can see I've got a class in here that's responsible for a platform specific um, implementation of SQL Cipher. So this is choosing an appropriate place on the iPhone to store the file and this is where we're specifying a really secure password. And then if we look at the same thing on Android, it's largely the same, but we do have to use a different way of choosing the location of the file on Android. And that may or may not be the same password. So that's um, how I'd approach implementing SQLite. Now, hopefully, as .NET Standard comes in, we'll get more straightforward ways of doing this, and we won't have to jump through so many hoops to share the, the SQL Cipher code. Um, <coughs> but yeah, there, there are there are ways to achieve that now. Um, it is a separate discussion and listed as a separate point on that OWASP top ten of how do you manage that password. I obviously shouldn't just have a password in clear text in my code for a number of reasons. OK, so I'll jump back to the presentation. So I mentioned earlier that the OWASP site has some cheat sheets on it. Um, it's actually got a lot of them these days, and they are really good. If, you, if you're in any doubt as to how you should be approaching something specific, this should be your first port of call. Um, and pretty much anything that the OWASP documents bring up, they've got a cheat sheet for what you should be doing to mitigate against that risk. Also have a Windows Mobile 10 security guide there if anyone's using that. Wait for all the phones to go down. Okay, so M3, insecure communication. We're not going to spend as long on each of these because time's ticking away. Um, but insecure communication would cover these. Um, and this is, sorry? Okay. Uh, the incubation is done by a single sample, right? Yeah. So the, in, 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 the incubation key also maintained by a single sample. <coughs> we, we, don't, we don't know or we don't need to care about the key. Uh, the key is that, that clear text password I had in the code. You, oh, you have to specify that, yeah. And they have. Um, they do have guidelines for that. And the, I've, I've got mentioned a bit further on whether or not you can use a hardware identifier as an encryption key. So there is there's very, very strong advice that you should never use a hardware identifier like an IMEI or a UDID as your encryption key. But SQL Cipher recommend that, well, they basically say you can use all or part of a hardware identifier as long as you don't well, what you can't do is take a hardware identifier and use that in its entirety with nothing else as your encryption key. What they recommend is that you take something like your IMEI and you get your user to enter something and you never store what your user enters, but you put that together somehow in your own way with the hardware identifier and use that as your encryption key. Uh, so that's make the, the idea of making the user enter something and never storing what the user enters is the only way to really keep that completely secure. But then you'll tend to come back to that discussion, user convenience versus security. You don't want them to have to enter a 12-digit pin every time they go to a different screen. Um, and yeah, finding that balance is interesting. Okay. Um, talking about the hardware identifiers, this does get interesting here. You'll see I've got highlighted clear text communication of sensitive data. Whether you're, if you're working in the enterprise space for a multinational or if you're distributing apps to the consumer marketplace, um, 
you'll no doubt be aware of localization issues and how you've got to assume your app's going to be downloaded in loads of different countries and you'll be watching that through your analytics, where does it get downloaded. Um, when it comes to handling of sensitive data, different parts of the world have different laws. Excuse me. And often the EU gets quoted as the one that's the most strict when it comes to privacy. But there are jurisdictions that consider those hardware identifiers to be personal information because they identify the phone that you're using. Uh, so as such, even if you were ending up using one of those for encryption or for anything else, for session management or something, um, you shouldn't be assuming that you can transmit that clear text because it's hardware identifier. If there's any chance your app is going to be uh, deployed into a jurisdiction where that would be a problem, then you've got to do something different. So it's useful to be aware of that when you're developing to start with and, and adopting those higher standards. So we'll have a brief look now at um, certificate validity. Um, who's familiar with using something like uh, Fiddler on Windows or Charles on a Mac? OK, so those are, that have done that will know it can be a little bit involved, but it's not actually that difficult to download that, set it up on your machine, uh, set it up as a proxy, enter the proxy details on your test device so that everything goes through there, have that issue a self-signed certificate, and if your app isn't checking certificate validity, it will consider that to be fine. It won't think that's a problem. It will send all the data, and your certificate can then be used to decrypt it, and you can get access to everything. Uh, meanwhile, the person that developed the app might think it's completely secure because it only requests things over HTTPS. So here's a way that we can check for that. Um, and that's by adding a service, server certificate validation callback. Nice catchy name. Um, you can see the first thing we're doing here is looking at the policy errors that get returned. So the policy errors will be things like um, if you go to a website and you get a warning message about the certificate saying uh, it's not issued by an authority that you trust or the date range is invalid, it's actually expired. Things that show up as warnings and on, in a browser you can choose whether or not you want to carry on, they would come back and there's, there's a defined list of them would come back as policy errors. And ideally you don't want to be getting any of those. Um, but the next thing you can then do is get the hash string of the certificate and compare that to a list of known hash strings and not only check you've got no errors, but check actually this is the exact certificate that I'm expecting and it's not a self-signed certificate issued by a third party trying to, um, trying to do a man in the middle attack and, and extract my data. I do often say, when I'm talking about mobile dev, that mobile dev is not web dev. It's very different. It's different ecosystems. Um, some of the skills are transferable, some of them aren't. This is one area where the, the advice is much in line with what you would be doing on the web. And specifically, if you've got a website that is already handling authentication and you're doing an app version of it, the app shouldn't allow authentication with any less authentication factors than the website is using and just making sure that is used as a, a yardstick for the authentication methods that, you're, that, that are, are being employed. Again, a comment in the OWASP guidelines, never use one of those uh, hardware identifiers as a, or to identify either a user or a session. Oops, sorry, I skipped past that, but I've already said that last point. I've um, got a, an example here that is it's going back a little bit now. It was from March 2016 uh, of uh, ways in which some quite high-profile mobile apps were uh, breached. And it, it made use of out-of-band authentication. So the idea of out-of-band was originally if you were doing, say, your, your personal banking via a browser on a PC and you'd had a good month and you wanted to transfer $10,000 from one account to another one, 
that might kick in something in the bank's validation and say, hang on, that's a large amount of money. I want to double check you are who you say you are. So they send a code to your phone by SMS. And the whole idea there is n to be able to do that, you've got to have access to your online banking website. You've got to have access to your phone. You've got to be able to get into your phone uh, and have the two things in the same place. So if someone's hacked into your, your account, they haven't got your phone, they can't do that. Um, this is kind of increasingly difficult now because out of band isn't, probably isn't going to mean out of band because you're probably doing something on your phone to start with and that's the device and that's the communication mechanism that, that's being used. So there's a, li there's a little less value in then sending an extra code to that same device because you're, you're no longer confirming not only have you got the device, you've also got access to the browser and the account. Um, and there was a... Um, uh, a breach of this that this news story talks about Australian banks that's because it's an Australian paper it wasn't only Australia that was impacted by this um, but what what these guys were doing was uh, they got a compromised version of the app out into the field that looked genuine but when an authentication code so as you logged in they could catch all your all your user details when an authentication code was sent their app would actually intercept it and act on it before you, you could do anything. So if we move on to uh, insufficient cryptography. There's some basic guidelines there. The most important being only store sensitive data if you really have to. If you don't need to capture sensitive data, then don't. If you don't need to store it, then don't. And if you're not capturing it and you're not storing it, your life will be made a lot easier from a security perspective. If you do need to, uh, then you do need to make sure that you are securing it in an approved way. Uh, and uh, you can see that I've referenced the cryptographic storage cheat sheet. You can get really detailed on this, and it's a whole subject by itself. There are approved algorithms and unapproved algorithms and yeah, it, it can get very complex. But there are guides on the OWASP site to walk you through it. I, I have already mentioned this when it comes to choosing your encryption key uh, with SQL Cipher. And there's just a reference to uh, where, where they put that up. But just to reiterate, as long as your encryption key contains something that is entered by the user and is never stored, that's the, that's the goal to make sure that it stays secure. So a, a few points here on insecure authorization. Um, some of the, for me, some of the breaches here would have been covered by that one, um, the, the top item on the 2014 list that was removed, and remember I said that was, it wasn't actually talking about weaknesses on devices, it was talking about weaknesses in uh, web service endpoints. Uh, one of those may well have fallen into this category, and that's, um, hopefully doesn't happen so much anymore, but I have come across uh, web service operations that assume the mobile app is the gatekeeper, and it will only send valid requests. So um, if a user has been authenticated on a device and they are trying to do an operation, the web service was then assuming that that user is allowed to perform that operation, uh, as opposed to actually doing the full authorization check uh, on the back end as well, which of course is required because the app isn't the only thing that can discover that endpoint and try and call into it. And you also can't assume the app is the gatekeeper if there are any chances the app has been compromised. So M7 is client code quality. Uh, and this is really where your, um, your training and practices and habits come in. Um, you remember the, the kind of figures I was quoting for the number of companies, I think it was 65% of companies were saying uh, accidental coding errors were causing security breaches. Um, that's why yeah, you look at some of that and think maybe this should be a bit higher in the list, but uh, there are other ones there. Um, 
one thing with this is if you, if you try to be really clever and you've mitigated all the other security risks, if your code can be compromised and someone can get in and modify it, they can basically bypass all other security checks that you've put in place. So th this remains a very, a very high priority one. So your mitigations would include developer education, uh, strict coding standards, making sure your code reviews cover security, uh, and possibly looking at the check-in hooks, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can also look at a static code analysis tool, and there's a bunch of those available, and you can run your code through those, and they'll come back and tell you what you've done that's insecure. If you've never done that, it's worth giving it a try because it'll probably tell you a whole bunch of stuff about generally improving things that you'll think, oh, maybe I should be doing that. Um, and there's also a reference guide and yet another cheat sheet on the OWASP site that can give you some really good pointers on making improvements here. A very short piece of code here on uh, code tampering. Um, if your device is jailbroken, then it's Wild West, all bets are off. Um, I, I gave a talk at NDC Sydney last year on uh, how to hack your own mobile app. Hopefully you wouldn't be hacking anybody else's. Uh, but there are, it, it's, it's not difficult, and maybe you wouldn't say completely trivial, but it's certainly not difficult to jailbreak your phone, decrypt the contents, and get in and have a look at plain text versions of what apps think has been secure, uh, stored securely. Um, because of that, a lot of apps that are working with sensitive data need to be checking that they're not running on a jailbroken phone. Um, there are multiple ways of jailbreaking phones, multiple ways of detecting that you're on a jailbroken phone, and as you'd expect, it's a moving target. So in the enterprise space, that often gets mitigated by deploying through an MDM tool like AirWatch or something similar, and they'll have their own jailbreak detection in place, and that kind of removes that responsibility from the app developer, but makes sure it is still handled in an auditable way. Uh, if you are checking yourself, this is one method you can use. Um, but yeah, remember, it's just one. You can't put that in your app and assume it's never going to be running on a jailbroken phone. Um, all that's doing is checking for the existence of the Cydia substrate. So Cydia is one of the things you can install to use to jailbreak your phone. And if that's successful, then it's installed. But a couple of points on reverse engineering. So just staying with iPhone for a moment, if you've jailbroken it and you can get hold of the binary, have a look inside the binary, decompile the code. Uh, if you're on Android, you can get the APK, unzip it, get in and look at the code in the same way. Run those through a decompiler engine, which again aren't difficult to get hold of, and you might find some code that you can make sense of. There is a really good blog post on the Xamarin blog on this. I don't know if you guys have seen that already. I've unashamedly stolen the pictures from it, but it's okay because I've included a reference to it at the bottom. Uh, Again, I don't know how small that code is looking to you, but um, as I say, I'll, I'll make the slides available. But that's just some sample code um, taken from a game, and you can look at that and see, okay, it's looking at um, collecting an item, checking if the item is a weapon or an arrow or a gem, and applying further checks if it's a gem. Is it shiny? Is it, is it rare? And either increasing or decreasing its worth. So if you're playing this game and you really like it and you get hold of this code, you can quite easily see some changes you could make to improve your experience. Um, if it's an online game, you can give yourself an unfair advantage, and depending on the game, maybe there's a black market to create profiles and sell them, and maybe you start actually earning a bit of money this way. So the, uh, the app developers probably wouldn't want you to be doing any of those things. Now, I'm mentioning Dotfuscator because if you're using Visual Studio, you already have access to a community version of it. And if you run that code through the community version, it'll look like this, which you, you can't glance at that and figure out what's going on. Um, you can look at it and see that something's being changed by some numeric values, and you could try changing those numeric values and play the game and see what happens and maybe figure some things out that way. But that would be assuming that you've worked out that an internal void called i, 
is actually collect item and you know that's the method you, you need to choose to be looking at. If you take the pro version of dot, uh, dot skater and run the code through that, you can see here that it's actually changing the structure of the code. And it's no longer easy at all to figure out what's going on. There are some numbers in there, but the numbers are completely different. And if you go change those, they're probably not going to change the end result in an expected way or a repeatable way. Um, I have seen other tools like this. There's one that Arcsan use which, uh, or, or provide, uh, which not only obfuscates like this, but it also injects dead-end process paths into your code. So if someone's trying to work through it, if you've got time on your hands, you maybe work through this code and step through, and not step through, but kind of work through manually and figure out what's going on. Um, Arcsan's product would include some red herrings and some dead-end codes where you could spend days working through only to find out that oh, that code just stops there and never does anything else and they would vary what gets injected with each compile. So if someone manages to crack one version of your app, you then release your next version, their knowledge is irrelevant. It, the, the landscape has changed on them. Uh, the last one on the list, uh, again, you, sorry, was that a question? Uh, I believe you have to go through some steps to install it and configure it still, but you have access to it, so you can do that. I haven't actually tried on the Mac, to be honest. I tend to live on the uh, Windows VM, uh, but that's um, the URL for the blog post, the Xamarin blog post, goes through how to install it and set it up, and it's, it's very detailed. It should give you everything you need. That that was one of the questions I've asked myself, and I, again, I haven't run through to check that yet. I'll be quite impressed if it does, but yeah, you've you, you got to hope. <laughs> so the, the last one, extraneous functionality, is where something's been left in by mistake that was never meant to go to production, or maybe you've actually, I know you, you've got a thousand developers, and one of them is a bit nefarious and has put something in there on purpose to improve his life. Um, I've got some comments here as well to say um, the, the certificate validity checking that we put in, and, and I've seen this happen where there are apps that are checking the validity of a certificate, but the dev environment and the test environment don't have certificates installed that meet those validity requirements. There's only production that has that, and there are times when it can be problematic to get the right certificates installed on all environments, especially if you're tearing down and rebuilding environments with any regularity. Uh, so I have seen apps which are doing that checking, but they commented out during development, so you can carry on testing. And then the danger is you leave it commented out, and it makes it all the way to production. Uh, or maybe you use pre-compiler directives, so it's, uh, it's only commented out in uh, debug builds uh, and not in release builds, or maybe you're setting up your own, uh, your own settings there you can end up with a bug in your CI scripts that are including something that you shouldn't be or not including something that, that you should be. So any errors like that would fall under, under this category. So just to finish off, I see we're just about out of time. Um, some pointers as to, to what you can do next. So um, this is going back again to that study from the Ponemon Institute, which is there. Um, yeah, don't call them Pokemon. Uh, th this is showing um, reasons for the existence of insecure code. And you can see, as we said earlier, rush to release is right up there. Accidental coding errors is right up there. And you know, there's, there's going to be quite a good relationship between those two. Um, so if you can generally improve your coding standards and coding processes and peer reviews, then you'll, you'll make good headway there in, in the general secur security of your app. And then some last pointers. If you want to take this further, then go beyond the OWASP top 10, then go check out the application security verification standards. It is interesting reading. Uh, it does get used by uh, large institutions as their, their yardstick for security. It provides three different levels of security as well, so you can choose do you implement the, the basic level or the, the full-on I'm doing everything level. Um, if you're handling credit cards, 
then you'll need to be looking at PCI standards as well. Um, and there's some notes on security policy, as I mentioned, in lack of internal policies is still listed as a reason for insecure code. So if you're working for an organization that doesn't have a security policy, then you should be pointing them at the OWASP guidelines as a baseline. If they do have a security policy, it should be reviewed against these guidelines. Um, one of my, yeah, the point I made earlier, mobile dev is not web dev, so you can't assume that somebody who knows everything there is to know about web security knows the same level of information about mobile security. You do need to be looking at the platform specific uh, requirements. Uh, and a lot of this can be addressed if you, it depends on the size of your organization, if you're able to establish and maintain a mobile center of excellence where you've got a, a dedicated team that all your mobile apps go through, you keep track of them, you can know that all the same uh, coding standards, deployment standards and methodologies are being applied. Uh, and then ideally, a combination of all of those. So I'll, I'll leave those up there. The next slide just says, thank you, any questions? Um, there are people hanging around outside. We'll maybe do some questions until we get kicked out. But uh, I'll, I'll be around today if anyone has any questions that haven't been addressed. Other than that, thank you very much. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. There, there is a, a recommendation that if you're working with sensitive data, you should be taking your own steps to secure it, and it should remain secure if the device that it's on is compromised. Now, how much effort you want to go to for convenience and timelines, it, it is certainly an argument that, okay, it is encrypted, there's a level of protection on the device, but one of the big points that I was off, make repeatedly is you can't assume that the device and the operating system do everything that you need them to do from a security angle. Yeah. Uh, we're a software developer. I'm from software developer company. A lot of uh, our clients uh, will ask for security. Uh, are we following OWASP or are we following this uh, security features? Yeah. But then the challenge is they ask for proof. Do you have certification? Do you, can you show us something or <coughs> Uh, you said that maybe if you have a dedicated center of excellence, but what if we don't? Is there any third party uh, software or application or body that we can use to show proof of yeah, there are, compliance? Yeah, there, there are a number of options there. Um, the one is if you gradually improving your own processes, the, the idea would be to do that in an auditable way. So if you're doing um, like automating testing with UI test and test cloud, you can prove it's been tested because you include screenshots and all the results of your test scripts. Um, ideally, you would be doing something similar from a security perspective. Now, doing all that yourself may not be practical, um, and that's where you can bring in things like a static code analysis tool. So as part of your, report, your security report on your app, you could include the report from the static code analysis tool. Uh, you could show, uh, again, in an auditable way that um, something like Dotfuscator has been run across the code and that's part of your CI process, so it always happens. Uh, you can also show that um, yeah, if you're using another product like the one I mentioned from Arcsan to kind of scramble the internals, that can also be done in a way that you can prove it's been run because it's part of your CI scripts and they'll pr produce logs and those logs can form part of your security report. Uh, so it's, yeah, you can, you can do all of it yourself if you really want to, but you can bring in tools that do certain parts and make it a lot easier for you to tick a box. And like I said right at the start, the aim is to be able to prove to somebody that that box is ticked in a way that they know they can believe and can prove to somebody else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the yeah.
Okay. Is that using the AirWatch component from the component store? Or have you written your own bindings for the AirWatch SDK on Android? Uh, it's not AirWatch SDK. I think it compacts uh, AirWatch. Yeah. I, I had, had discussions with AirWatch about two years ago now because I needed to write an iOS app that's integrated with it. And all I could get from them at that point in time was their iOS native SDK. And I had to write uh, Objective-C level bindings to bring that into Xamarin to expose things so I could do what I needed to from Xamarin. Uh, and that's what that, that binding, that's what now what the AirWatch component in the component store gives you. Um, but the, the process was, how can I put it? It wasn't as smooth as I was expecting it to be. That it didn't provide everything I was expecting it to provide. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is code analyzing do you suggest? I'm sorry. Say again. Which is code analyzing tool you suggest for Yamrin board? <coughs> I haven't actually seen one that really makes a thing of supporting Xamarin. It's generally just C-sharp ones. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I haven't, I don't, I don't, don't have a specific preference to be honest, but uh, anything that you can but build into your CI process if you're going to use it. I use SonarCube, I think it's good. Okay. Yeah, our, our guys use that for Java stuff. Yeah. Okay.